Welcome to the Great Things LLC podcast. I'm your host, Josh Meter. Welcome listeners. Uh, Today's podcast, I get to uh, share a story of someone who I have just been absolutely had a joy and pleasure of getting to know. Um, I could take a lot of time. I don't know if there's enough hours in a day in this podcast to just kind of go over some of the stuff that uh, Rachel Allen has done and who she is in the community that she's built. So uh, let's, without further ado, I want to introduce and welcome Rachel to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Rachel, leading up to this, I was, I was, I've been really struggling. I was like, how do you introduce what you've done? Because you've done a lot. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we have taglines, but yours really does kind of boil it down. So to uh, merging music, yoga, and community, when you shared right. that with me, I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's you, but uh, it's also much broader than that. So uh, we're here today, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about is your book uh, that has just been released, Blessings Beyond the Bypass, Tender Medicine for Hard Times. So um, why don't you start with sharing a little bit about yourself and the oh. things you've done to this point, and we'll get into how the book came in and what this is for for these times that we all find ourselves in. Right. Yeah, I always find it interesting when people ask what what I do in the world. I, I always I just laugh. <laughs> and uh, my my sister Kelly, she lives in Australia, and she works in the sector of dealing with people that lack housing. She always tells me I'm a musical social worker, which of course there's no like, you know, credentialing for that. Um, but that's what she calls me. <laughs> uh, and so I I, I what in a nutshell what what i what i uh intend to do to all the spaces that i show up is to um be in spaces with people where where anything is possible where the potential for healing lies with the potential for authenticity for for whatever is real to show up for that person and to transform perhaps um so a lot of the work that i do i don't show up with an agenda other than to be in the space feel what's in the space and how what 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 is the best tool that I could bring to respond to the space that I'm in with people? I do that um, in hospice work. I've done that for 18 years. I play the harp. So I work with people that are in any phase of transition, um, in which could be somebody a, a year from their transition. It could be during their transition. It could be with their family as part of that, or just that person alone if they don't have family. Uh, so I've done that work for 18 years. Um, I, I'm a yoga teacher. I, I, I bring music. It's infused throughout my practice. And a lot of my um, practice is in partnership with um, organizations that serve different types of communities. Um, for example, I, for 10 years, I've worked with our Rape Crisis Center and Domestic Violence uh, Center to serve survivors of trauma. Uh, I also come into other spaces such as uh, a state mental hospital, their forensic locked on unit and other spaces like that and and offer practice as well as in my community right now, I'm still teaching outside, which is really nice. So it's more like a public space where anybody can come. And um, yeah, so I, I show up in different places and spaces with people and hope to connect through music, through shared practice and invite that, that sort of, um, like what everybody brings to that energy is is equally important as what I'm bringing. So so sort of, you know, working with people in those spaces and places. And as part of your work, a lot of it has been based around trauma in informed work, uh, underserved injustices, and really how that is woven into the community and how the community heals. So uh, from what I've learned from you, a lot of it is uh, this uh, place of trauma informed health and healing and growing. Right, right. Uh, part of part of the experience of trauma is not feeling that one is worthy of care. Um, part of the experience of trauma is is, you know, the the absence of connection. And so we don't heal in silos and and when we can uh come alongside people rather than come over people but come alongside people uh i i really strongly believe that we we that, that pathologizing trauma is not helpful it's a, it's a, a normal response of the central nervous system uh to keep ourselves alive <laughs> mm -hmm. so 
when someone experiences trauma, um, you know, the, the way that their nervous system responded a lot of times, especially if it's the freeze response, there's judgment. So finding ways to, to, uh, support the integration um, of somebody's nervous system um, is is you know even with with our own presence you know having that awareness that that each being has has value because they exist not because of what they've done or haven't done but because they they're here and so you know finding ways to integrate that into how we are with people is part of trauma-informed care and with uh, the uh, concept of trauma, especially over the last few years, uh, one trauma is present in so many. And if it's right. unaddressed, it can manifest in a lot of different ways. And trauma can be big or big or small in quotation marks. But the reality is whatever trauma is to that person is big to that person and learning how to meet. So over the last uh, few years with with the pandemic, with all the unrest, both socially, environmentally, economically, politically, uh, it feels like trauma has actually been infused in daily life to a higher degree. Blessings Beyond the Bypass is a book that, uh, it, in its title, explains it, Tender Medicine for Hard Times. These have been hard times in recent years. What was the, the impetus or the thought that created the spark for you in creating this book? Sure. I think one of the things that, that shows up for me often is sitting down and deeply listening in which, which is a process called unitative listening, like seeking to, to connect into what's beyond the, the, the surface noise, um, that's present. It's really loud and to sit and, and, and really deeply listen to, to what are the needs that are present. You know, and and what could I possibly? How can I possibly be of service? How can I possibly be of service? Um, I I had created. Uh, I had um, different people in my community reach out to me over COVID, and one was one of our local healthcare systems, and and they were. This is at a time when like the emergency room. I mean, the the the, the COVID units were overflowing. The deaths were really high, and. And I created uh, like just tools for healthcare workers, like how, how, you know, and here they are in respirators, and, you know, but like, how, how can you prep? How do you prepare for something like that to walk into those types of situations? And then you have to go home, you know, to your family. So, so giving people, you know, some of the things that I offer as tools are so simple, um, but people don't know how to access them, you know? And I think that this blessings beyond bypass um, emerged from just like recognizing that all of our experiences are so different during this this time. All of our experience is not the same as somebody who's going in and being in that environment. But what can I offer to someone? I, I don't know what their experience is like, but I, but what can I offer that could be a service? And so so many people um, that I love were really hurting, including myself, during that time. I had a, a friend, my neighbor, um, who was a, a nurse in a long term skilled care facility, and she actually had to live up there for six weeks mm. during the most intense part of COVID. She left her family for six weeks to live there. And so it was just sort of, you know, seeing the some of the extraordinary things that people were doing, some of the sacrifices and wanting to honor that as well as as just seeing that, that people were in need of medicine and and when I say medicine, I mean something that could reach them at the soul level and everything that was up here that was the noise wasn't even touching that so wanting to 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 dive a little deeper and and offer well, what what is what is here like and for me there's always this part of my practice is always to when i'm feeling things like anger and grief and, and sadness is to like draw deep into well, what is the value system that I come from? You know, what, what, it, what, what are the values that I hold? And can I allow what I deeply care about to inform my anger and grief and allow that to sort of tracing that back to compassion, to love, to, to caring for the desire for connection and allowing the, the building my capacity to hold space for all of those things in, in, in my being. Right hold space for all of those emotions that are challenging, as well as the ones that I that I draw from, 
if that makes any sense. It does. And that that was that tender point that really hooked me in your words in the book is the place that we all have impact in and are impacted by what is out there. So we do feel these things, and especially it was heightened through the pandemic and still coming out, is there is anger, there is grief, there is feelings of injustice, there is feelings of disempowerment and all these negative things. And in your opening in the foreword of the book, you, you speak to that a little bit about like, for lack of a better uh, word, uh, word, the woo culture or like the, the guru is like, oh, it's all love and light. And, <laughs> and it's almost shaming the, the shadow side and not allowing that to be recognized. And then how to transmute that in one to identify it, to see where it's coming, to check in and then to identify it into a place where you can speak from compassion, even when there's disagreement. Right. Right. And a lot of that is felt in the body when we try to create when we uh, we have the tendency and I'll speak just to my own experience because it's the only one I have. I have the tendency to to more be analyzing it and creating a story about it rather than just allowing myself to land in, in, in my body and sort of experience it and build capacity for something else to emerge there. So so for me, a lot of the, what emerged from the book was was getting out of the story that my mind was telling me, which was was connected to the noise that was up here and getting back into my body and allowing myself to feel and 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 create space for my the the deepest held values that I that I have to to feel all of that in my body mm-hmm. and then the words come from there <laughs> instead right. of the noise that's up here there's also a place of expansion in that process um when we have a stimulus or a reaction there's an emotion and there's the tendency to lean forward or to move into it without taking that pause to look back to reflect and you know again when you say speaking to experience i'll speak to mine i have learned that if if there is that that space the reactions and the responses become better they become more connective they become more informed if you can just realize and create space between the reaction this book seems to give the the tools as you say they're they're simple they're short they're reflections and affirmations and prayers for the wisdom and the patience to learn how how you you can show up uh in our earlier conversations this was a place that i'm always curious about is how how do we move those forward from a place of, let's say there's an, uh, a sense of injustice. Uh, someone's not able to defend themselves or they're um, underserved and there's anger at the injustice. How does that translate? Because it can go to outright protest, it can go to withdraw. But in, in cases like that, what are some of the, the thoughts or experiences that you're sharing in this book? What do we do with that when we feel that? Right. And I think I think we feel all of the things I know just for an example, um, I'll just share an example that's informed me greatly is is having the experience of parenting my daughter who has spina bifida. And I had no idea before I had her that the world was created by able bodied people like I had no idea because I'm an able bodied person and and environmental obstacles uh, weren't something that I noticed, you know. And, and, it, and it's through like um, parenting her. There's times where I felt like 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 blind rage at like times where she hasn't been able to access supports because of maybe a building or maybe um, any number of things. And, and it's sort of like okay, but but what what is what is, what do I model to her? What do I model to her? Mm-hmm. And, and 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 a lot of it's like even in people's attitudes. Like when she was younger. And still even now, but when she was younger, people would come up to us and say, what's wrong with her? And, and, and my husband and I would say, she's really mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then people would be like, you know, giving a different answer. People would be really confused by that. But it was, you know, it was just, it, but, but it was something like it, like it brought an awareness, like, well, I probably have that attitude I, that, that I have to unpack as well, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like a whole we're always we're always given the the opportunities to unpack beliefs and beliefs are in, in the yogic tradition samskaras they're they're neural networks in the brain and the, oftentimes we don't understand how our beliefs are informed they they're informed by culture we grew up in they're informed by 
you know, our, our family, the community we grew up in, some of them are acquired through our personal experiences. That doesn't mean they're always the, the best beliefs to have. And so, so sort of being able to objectively unpack beliefs and, and look at, well, like what, what is, what, what, where, where is there a path for um, a way to change beliefs? And when Riley was, I think nine months, I started with two other moms and for three years, we raised money to fund, we raised $250,000 and we built an all-inclusive playground in our community. That was three years of, of, of like channeling <laughs> that, that, that awareness. Like I realized when, when my daughter was six months old, I'm like, she's not gonna be able to access any of these playgrounds around here, even though they're supposedly ADA compliant. You can't take a wheelchair through mulch. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, you can't. And so, so it was, it was sort of like, oh, that, that was like, that was something that, that made me cry and it made me rage and it made me scream. But if I would have stayed in that place, of crying, raging, and screaming, and curling up in a little ball and saying, this is so unfair, life is so unfair. It wouldn't have been uh, possible to have this playground that now still exists. <laughs> so, you know, I think all of those things show up and, and it's just understanding, like, like allowing them to happen. I mean, I've learned a lot through raising my daughter and also um, affirming for her that nobody's doing you a favor. These are rights that exist that for you as a human being. So when you need to access support, nobody's doing you a favor. These rights, these are, these are your rights as a human. It might take more collaboration and cooperation, but one of the things that I have come to realize is in that space where there might be injustice and it takes more effort to bring someone to the table that, that they're, to bring that person to the table is like so worth it because their experience is so different than mine. And I would not know that if that person's voice wasn't, wasn't present, if that and meandering <laughs> answer to your question makes any sense. It, 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 it takes, I think it takes a lot of work um, personally and, 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 you know, unpacking the neural networks. I mean, Honestly, when, when I first found out I was having a child with spina bifida, I thought, oh, does this mean I can't go camping anymore? You know, I mean, my, my thoughts were selfish. It was like, oh, this is going to be inconvenient for things like this. And it's like, yeah, it is going to be inconvenient for things like this. And you do it anyway. Right. And you learn. And in my belief system, and I think we have kind of resonated with this, when I see a situation, my first go to is, is it creating separation or connection? Yeah. And that's kind of my gateway. And when it goes into separation, it's a it's a different pathway for me. And yeah. and there has been so much separation in recent years, just uh, really the marginalization of people just by titles like oh you believe this or you're leaning this way or you're supporting this and for whatever's happened it seems we're now just really putting people in boxes right, right off and you're taking away their humanity and their their authenticity and it closes down uh conversation and it's like well how do you bridge gaps how do you bridge gaps with someone who may believe something that is so antithetical to every fiber in your being and not just go straight into judgment and, and condemnation? And you said curiosity. And I thought that was such a wise, uh, gentle way in to find that. So how does someone develop a curiosity or what does that look like? That first self-reflection can be uncomfortable if you're not used to doing the inner work. Right. And I think like resourcing ourselves for discomfort is part of that. And, and understanding that understanding our nervous systems is crucial to doing any of this kind of work, recognizing that we will be, uh, our nervous systems will be activated when we're having difficult conversations, um, recognizing that some of that activation will prevent us from deeply listening to someone and being, and, and that doesn't mean when I'm talking to someone or if I have a conversation with someone, that doesn't mean that I'm accepting their beliefs. And it doesn't mean that I'm not creating a boundary for myself. And it doesn't mean that I might not even reflect back to them, but I'm gonna do it in a way that's not shaming to them. Um, and just like from cu curiosity. But I think one of the things that happens is um, when you're talking about these these sort of silos is, is you know, we, we don't know what other people's experiences are. We, we can't. I can't know what it is to be someone other than myself. 
but I can listen to someone without saying, oh yeah, I know how you feel, or, oh, that happened to so, and you know, I think like being able to listen to someone <clears throat> and maybe reflect back to them, well, I heard you say this word, can you tell me what that word means to you? Mm -hmm. you know? Or, or wow, I'm so curious about that, that feeling that you shared when, when you read that sign, or, you know, I think that it takes us, you know, part of my own practice in, in doing um, justice work has been resourcing myself for discomfort and, and it's not going to kill me to be uncomfortable you know i can i can resource myself i can build my capacity for discomfort uh because i think that th that is where growth happens in, Dis in it discomfort is almost that that icing or that surface layer that you have to crack through to find that place of connection um, because in everyone's unique and individual experiences, it's my world belief that there are some some real universals and some real aspects of humanity that, you know, can find common ground. And to me, it's how do we get into that to start from that rather than the outward? Right, right, right. And I think it's 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 tearing down the walls that we put up um, when in our conversations, mm -hmm. you know. You know, being able to do that and, and being able to be with some of the rawness of that and being able to be in conversation without resolution. Because, I mean, honestly, some of these things that have been around here for, you know, racism has been here for 400 years. Do we think, um, do I have the capacity or do I have the ability to believe that so I can say something that's going to change that? You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, how do, how do we how do we be with one another? And I think uh, I, I think about this often where we we skate on this like thin veneer of politeness and niceness. And I'm not saying that the opposite of that is rudeness and call out culture, because that's that's like, ugh. but but can we have like, can we can we, you know, we have to learn how to talk about our humanity with one another without shutting down. We know mm -hmm. how to talk about the weather. I'm tired of talking about the weather. I don't want to talk about the weather yeah, anymore. It happens every day. So <laughs> right, right. Unless it's something ca catastrophic, but um, I think we have to we have to learn how to talk about our humanity, and and that's part of of is that connection, you know, mm -hmm. being able to connect with somebody without needing to say, oh, I know how you feel, but being able to just like, wow, that person, I, I, I heard the pain in their voice, yeah. you know, the power I, of witnessing someone's experience, right, right, that witness experience is really, yeah, yeah, and the uh, trust, I again love what you said about being comfortable with the unresolved because it's it's a process it's not a path we're not changing long-held cultural beliefs or you know family beliefs but when in just simple human act, human interaction terms if you find someone that you're at odds with as soon as you don't give them space to be heard it's it's always it's always confrontation Mm -hmm. If you can go into that space and at least they feel heard, it brings that energy down. And learning to cultivate those tools is such um, such a gift to share with the world. But also you're working with teachers in different modalities to say, hey, how do you create this safe space in these these trainings? So um, I know you've done that in some of the community organizations that you've been in. Uh, let's dive into that a little bit of uh, the safe spaces you've created and how that ability to see, witness and allow to right. be heard has manifested within your community. Right. And I, I, I would call them more brave spaces because I can't assume that I know what a safe space is for everyone. Um, when, I, when I'm working in certain environments, we'll often form what we call community agreements. So people can share what they need for themselves to be in that space. For example, uh, I work with a lot of people in recovery. So, so uh, often people will say, I need everybody here to be sober in this space. Uh, uh, so that, that might be a community agreement. Uh, another one might be, I don't want to, I don't want people to talk about politics here or, you know, so, so some of those things can be established through um, people sharing that, you know, and sharing what, what, what they, they need to have it be a safe space, confidentiality, you know, things like that. But I think more importantly is a space where people can just be themselves, mm -hmm. you know, you know, to, to, to show up and, and be mourning or celebrating, 
Um, and that can shift. It can shift. So like the container that that's held in has to be sort of like malleable. It can't be this like concrete form. You know, it, you know, pe people come, especially doing trauma work, people come with a myriad of experiences and responses and are all different places on the, that, that path. Um, mm -hmm. Which is why I also work in collaboration with other professionals in those spaces. So there's like not just me. There's you know that there's a sort of a, a shared um, energy towards you know co-creating a lot of those a lot of those spaces and a lot of it for me too. I think I mentioned when I go into the forensic lockdown unit at Torrance, uh, it's intense. There's corrections officers everywhere. They're they're uh, whatever those little radios, I don't know if they have a different name now with technology, radios, CD, whatever. They're, you know, going off and announcements are happening and, and I'm inviting people to breathe. And I close my eyes in that space where there's like 75 people in a circle around me and there's like 10 CEOs walking all around and I close my eyes. And, and I feel after about two or three breath cycles and I don't know if that would energy would shift if my eyes were open, but I know that I close my eyes every time and the energy shifts mm -hmm. just from allowing myself to be vulnerable in that space. And, and that, that communication can shift that energy, not let I'm the authority. And then I'm like putting a hierarchical energy towards my, my, my place in the circle, but I'm uh, to the best of my ability, facilitating and modeling that vulnerability and, and that that way of accessing presence. Because that's that's unique in in your your position, because you have people that are coming to you by choice. And in some cases, it may be adjudication or they may not want to be there. So right. creating that 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 openness or that vulnerability has to shift radically between between those two scenarios, I would imagine. It does. It does. And it's so interesting. I didn't share this with you before, but um, a couple years ago, this was another prison environment that I was going into for five years. I taught at Cambria County Prison, which is a county facility, which county facilities can be challenging because they don't have the programming that state and federal institutions have. And, and, and it's it's pretty intense. Um, but one of the corrections officers ended up coming to my regular class that was here in my home studio and I had it open. And it was so interesting, like she came to the class with her partner, who was also a corrections officer. And uh, she said to me after the class, she said, you know, you, you and the other people, one of which was my husband, who have been coming in, he was teaching men, I was teaching women. She said, the way that you are with people has just changed my entire orientation. And it was just so interesting because she would she would see things were always very intense in that environment and i could i could tell my presence was disruptive to the flow that they had and my intention was not to be disruptive but i recognized that just my presence there was you know so mm -hmm. i didn't take it personally like if, if people were the ceos were like short with me they're all dysregulated as well and so i i, I never took any of that personally and i would just try to be as professional and and grounded you know uh, going into those types of environments, recognizing nobody here is regulated, but so but would remain regulated and and work really hard to resource myself for that before going there. Um, but the, this woman, she, you know, her and her partner, they come to our, the home studio, and she was just like, the, you know, I I I I've, I witnessed you with boundaries and firmness, but yet like how you treated people was just eye opening to me. And, and it was just so interesting because our intention was not to go in there and change the way the CEOs saw the inmates. It was, it was to prevent, like, it, like the overarching goal was to prevent recidivism and, you know, getting people connected before they were released, working with the courts and probation and having sort of like a transition for people. Um, so our intention had nothing to do with the CEOs, but this person, it was just so interesting to me that like the way that that we cultivated presence in those spaces shifted and altered her path. Yeah, you wouldn't think, I mean, when you're talking about a prison situation, the thoughts I think initially go to the inmates, right? right. But the, that is the larger staff and a beautiful thing to be able to give them a wider perspective. Just ask the question, how is that received? I'm sure there were some uh, 
some inmates that were not open to receive it, but the ones that were, what was uh, an experience like for that? Was that uh, to actually be seen? How did that bring a human, you know, their human spirit forward in just awful circumstances? Right. Well, the first class I taught in there, it was interesting. We worked for two years to get into the prison <laughs> and the prison itself was built for men. My husband was actually a union carpenter at the time, and he was part of building that facility. But in the, the challenges that my community had faced, uh, more and more females uh, were in, in incarcerated. In fact, so many that they took over a whole wing and a lot of them were mothers. So it was like a lot of disruption in the community. And mm -hmm. There's a lot of judgment. Um, there's a lot of judgment against anyone who's a parent that, that deals with addiction, but much more so against women who are mothers than men who are fathers. And so the idea was to go in and, and help prevent uh, recidivism and sort of connect people. But the first class that I went to teach, every single woman had her Bible with her. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone has their Bible. This is so interesting. And I was like, well, we won't be needing that book today, but you can put it aside. And I, I, it was actually very interesting because I actually love teaching yoga to people that don't have any sort of um, experience with yoga studio culture. It, it's, it's refreshing. And to be able to tell people that this is a practice that helps us cultivate the, the fluctuations of the mind. This is a practice that helps us address suffering. You know, nobody in my life had ever told me how this is how you deal with suffering. It was like, suck it up, buttercup, or like, oh, you poor thing. So there is something other than suck it up, buttercup, or a pity party, you know, and right. this is, these are tools. And, and so I found that most people were hungry for those tools because no one ever teaches us how to deal with suffering. At least in my experience, it was suck it up, buttercup. Or, oh, you poor thing, mm -hmm. oh, you poor thing. And it was like, th neither of those are, are remotely helpful. <laughs> no, and it's such a place where I see that a lot in the youth and our children today. We haven't, I, we haven't done the greatest job in building their resiliency. You know, this, um, you know, it's oh. great we make things good for our kids, but, you know, my son taught me a great lesson one time. He, you know, did a young teenage boy dumb thing. And I was really upset. I was upset because he just didn't use his wisdom, you know, and he's a wise kid, but he's also, it was a young boy made a bad mistake. And I was really, really frustrated. And he looked at me and he's like, dad, I know you're just trying to protect me and don't want me to get hurt, but right. I got to learn. I got to make my own mistakes. And, you know, in that moment of just like, Oh, I'm so mad. I'm like, Oh, I'm so mad. And you're so right. You know, you threw that right. wisdom right back. It was such a great teaching and allowing our children to to suffer or to fail and helping them through with tools to understand what that is to build right. that resiliency right and and, and uh middle class america is afraid of doing that <laughs> it's like you know when i taught at saint francis it's like the young people are, are taught to think that they're the center of the universe and it's it's really harmful you know i mm -hmm. think sometimes for for people to I know with my son, he, he was a, he's, a, he's an amazing musician, you know, amazing. And people used to tell him all the time, you're so amazing. What an amazing. And I'm like, OK, you're let, let's just put things in perspective. You're an excellent musician. That has nothing to do with your character. If you, you know, if you want to be a good person, you have to have character. And just because mm -hmm. you can play a guitar well and play the violin and all these other instruments doesn't it remotely mean that you're a good person. Don't get confused. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. I know it would, uh, in our house, we had three rules and they were up on the wall by on the kitchen. It was do the right thing, tell the truth and be kind. Yes. And those like for me, that was such just a simple thing. It's like everything else, you know, any situation can fall within those rules. Like, did you do the right thing? Were you kind? Did you tell the truth? And, you know, so how you've talked a little bit about the the adult work that you've done with with adults. Um, how do you see this coming forward in in children and giving more resources to our youth? Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, you know, I see a lot more. Uh, uh, I see a lot more um, openings for kids to learn more about mindfulness and their belief systems. Uh, I, I, I haven't been a big fan of a lot of the bullying programs that are in schools. 
because I think that they teach very like surface behavior types of things and they use things like slogans and they don't necessarily connect to belief systems. Um, so, so that, that I'm seeing a little bit of a shift from that, which I think is, you know, helpful. I mean, I think, I think we've, you know, we've known for years psychologically that punishment and reward is not like a, a, a belief system changer. Um, but yet we still see those types of things in a lot of, in, in our criminal justice system and, in schools. And so I, you know, I, I think that there's, a, um, you know, I see s some openings for that with, with more mindfulness oriented things. Um, I think a lot of young people have opportunities to, for service that I think are great that, that we didn't have a lot of that when I was younger and, mm -hmm. and. I see like in, in our school district, um, which is a school district that has a lot of uh, poverty and challenges. I, I love that the, 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 the two service clubs in our school district are so active and they're serving their own community. They're not like, here I am in the wealthy community coming down to serve the poor people. These are like, these students are like, these are the people, these are my, this is my family. This is my neighbor. And, and it's, um, to me, there's, there's such an enthusiasm in, in, the young people that are in those service clubs because they're serving their own people. They, they already know what their needs are. They don't need somebody else from like an ivory tower to come in and tell them what their needs are. They already know that. And, and they're, they're meeting their community. Yeah. I love that. I think that's so powerful. Well, the, uh, the aspect of service, uh, there was a book, It's Not About You by Tom Rath. That was just a phenomenal book. A man who had all sorts of health problems and when you go into service or support of other it's amazing how the attitude the perspectives and just actually the quality and well-being in your own health can shift right. yeah so right. so good to have those those available to kids right and to adults let's be frank for everyone in the service of right. others right right and it, and it can be humbling i know with the harp when i'm working with patients sometimes what works for people especially if they're in a lot of pain or if they're actively dying is playing three notes. <laughs> so, you know, you have to get out of your head and be like, I need to make this sound great because these people are sitting here in the room and I'm playing three notes. And they're probably like, what's going on with this harp player? Doesn't she know how to use her instrument? But, you know, if you pay attention to this, you know, if you pay attention to what's needed and you don't bring your own projections on there, which is really difficult, <laughs> really be of service. But if, if you're doing it because you want validated or an award or a sticker or, you know, it, 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 it yuckies it up a bit. Yeah. Yeah. That beautiful, <laughs> humble curiosity is a great entry point to about any situation. Right. So, uh, so your book is out. Uh, we'll share how people can get access to this book. My favorite pa passages is the uh, the closing passage, the uh, the daily blessings, oh, and um, yeah. I just I love this, Rachel. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read this to to the audience. So this yeah. is a daily blessing. May you begin each day with a curious mind and an open heart. May the end of the day find you with your integrity intact. May you recognize longing as the soul's desire to evolve. May you value absurdity and the sacred in equal measures. And may you allow yourself to be held, blessed, and illuminated. So be it, so may it be. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, that I just that resonated with me, uh, specifically the point of valuing absurdity and the sacred in equal measures. Because mm -hmm without the long story that that just landed and because it is such a beautiful sacred gift that we have in this life and it's also absurd in the whole scheme of the length of time of the planet so we have to be intentional and right. we can't take ourselves too seriously and that just summed it up so so well right right yeah i i agree i agree yeah i love absurdity it's, it's my favorite thing <laughs> We should have t-shirts, practice absurdity. Let's start the Let's movement today. Yes, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> All right. So with our absurdity practice already in, and I am very cautious on throwing ideas out with you because I know you are a dynamo and a powerhouse and a manifester of epic proportions. <laughs> um, 
So with the, the, the book is out, we'll share that in the link, but you're also working on a companion piece for this. Right. What, what's coming up uh, with this extension? Right. So, so I'm basically sharing my process and, and, and it'll show up in the form of um, the book is in three parts and it'll show up with a preparatory practice, uh, how, how, I, how, how to gather support, um, gathering from the, the you, you know, connecting to your values, connecting to the teachings and the wisdom that, that inform you, um, which might be very different from mine. So I'm not telling people what their values are, but I'm inviting them to explore that. Uh, and then, you know, the exploration of all of these different parts, the exploration of what is the exploration of liminal space of life um, it, it through like a practice and then maybe some questions to, to, to go deeper and then, and then having the blessing. So, so sort of looking at, at some of my process um, and, and inviting people to explore that as a practice. They could, they could certainly do it as like a whole uh, experience. They could, you know, the preparatory one, I think, is one um, I, I draw from one of my main teachers, Joanna Macy, and another uh, Buddhist teacher, Lama Rod Owens. And it's a really lovely practice where you draw in your supports, you draw in the, the, the teachers, the mentors, um, and, and you can even imagine them walking beside you, looking in your eyes, holding your hand. Uh, you draw in the teachings that you've metabolized and integrated. You know, not thinking about like, here's the quote, but, but you know, things that, that have landed in your body. Drawing on your, your lineage, whether that be your blood lineage, your chosen lineage of, like for me, it's people that work with music and words and movement. Um, you draw upon your ecosystem, you know, the ecosystem that you, you are forged from and you know you, you do that work from this place of having that support with you you know and which can be really really helpful when we're dealing with challenging emotions this isn't a substitute for therapy or mental health intervention but it can be a, mm -hmm. a complement to, to dealing with um challenging things I, I think the liminal the blessing for liminal space i'm like we're still you know we're, we're still in liminal space like we're you know, but it also like looking at that, like threshold time is seen in so many cultures as sacred. So what can we mm -hmm. bring into that? So, so it's sort of like diving a little bit like into what produced the blessings, my process, giving specific practices, inquiries. Um, people could do them in a group. They could do them as standalones. If they're, uh, I'm suggesting if they do them as standalones to, to do the preparatory one with the supports for each, you know, process. Right. But, It'll be one that people can use in workshops or classes or however they want to use it. Um, I'll probably guide so some for self or for their practice, whatever right. their practice may be to help. Right, you know. right, right. If people could do it in as individuals, they could do it in community, you know, whatever, however that shows up for people. And I'll have that available um, as a free PDF on my website. Okay. We'll put all the links to your contact. You'll be able to find Rachel in the description here. Uh, the book Blessings Beyond Bypass, uh, first book out from Seed House Press, uh, which just want to throw a little uh, congratulations out to Seed House, Pre Seed House Press and acknowledge uh, Kimberly McElhatton, who helped uh, bring this book forward with you. Absolutely. It's uh, her dream. Uh, Kimberly is a good friend. She's also a uh, integral part of my business and, and she's a writing coach in her own own right so a little shout out to see how house press uh rachel is there anything you'd like to uh, leave us with here this afternoon hmm. i just really appreciated the conversation and i'm really blessed uh, i've had people share with me how they've been using the book so that to me is is really helpful not just like hey i read your book it was great <laughs> but this is how i you know i used your book uh one uh person i do consulting work for a long-term care facility and one of the people she's actually moving to another job but she's like i used your book to help me just practice discernment with my process and that was really i i really was so appreciative of that and that's the the intention is for this to be a tool you know, maybe some for some folks it'll be a one and done, you know. <laughs> oh, that was great. Let me put it on the pile. But I'm I'm hoping that it can be a tool and then with the facilitator's guide, even, you know, to dig even a little deeper with it. So I'm I mean, I'm grateful to Seed House Press too, because Kim 
uh, always Kim's like, okay, now you need a facilitator's guide. <laughs> Cause we're, I was talking about my process. She's like, people need to know that <laughs> this is helpful. So I, I love, uh, Kim from Seed House Press has been such an integral part of my development as a writer. You know, I came to her as a, as a blogger and have, have published now on at least half a dozen platforms. And I have a, like a byline with an international blog team. And, you know, she's, she's just really good at like, yeah, uh, supporting me in my process. Okay, I know you can dive a little deeper, Rachel. Go for it. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I am grateful for both of you, uh, but specifically you, Rachel, for all that you're doing here in the community in in the world. Uh, the book uh, Blessings Beyond Bypass is available. I highly recommend it. Uh, and I'll share the story. I told Rachel I'm not a book reader. I love audio books, but I'm just not a book reader. So. I'm like, well, I got to do the research. And I'll tell you what, I dove in. It is an easy read. It is so natural. And um, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, so go out, get your copy. Um, there's instructions on how to use it. You can do it all at once. You can do it in daily chunks. But the uh, the best thing to do is open it up and just get started. It's a thank wonderful you. book. It is needed in these times. Uh, and again, Rachel, thank you for the time. I look forward to seeing what's coming next and the next time we can play or dance together again. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for watching. If you liked what you saw, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button right now. Stay tuned and check out the channel for other interesting and informative videos.